today we're going to, um, you know, the, the lecture, the topic was given as uh, eyelid reconstruction. Um, and in the US, uh, you know, this typically means like skin cancer reconstruction. But I know here in Jamaica, um, people are blessed with more pigment and fewer skin cancers. So um, we decided to kind of tailor the lecture a little bit more um, towards, uh, you know, trauma um, as opposed to skin cancer excisions and reconstructions. Um, my colleague, uh, Antonio Lucio Alvarez um, is going to actually give a talk as well. So he's going to focus a little bit more on the details of eyelid laceration repair. Um, so I'll very briefly touch on this so I don't duplicate his work. Um, and then we'll talk about um, scarring as well, because that's something that applies to all cases of trauma. Uh, and it's something that can be easily managed, you know, um, outside of the OR. And it's very important to the reconstructive and the healing process. Um, and it's also an area of interest for me personally. This is a patient of mine who, um, you know, very commonly we have skin cancers that form on the eyelid. And this was a basal cell carcinoma. Um, she had a fairly large segment taken out. Uh, and this is a rotational flap. It's, we call it a reverse tensile flap. So first, of, first we bring the lid margin together. But in order to do that, we have to mobilize a semicircular flap, uh, release the um, superior cruse of the lateral canthal tendon to slide everything over. So we're borrowing tissue from the temporal region. But again, we'll save that for another lecture. <laughs> okay, so we have a series of audience response questions. Um, uh, the people on board the plane here have clickers, so uh, you can uh, answer this question. The people at home, you can answer in your heads. Uh, but uh, the question is, what must be done in an upper eyelid laceration when orbital fat is prolapsing. So A, repair the orbital septum. B, explore the levator upon neurosis. C, perform force duction testing. And D, explore the trochlea. Oh, all right. So repair the orbital septum and explore the levator upon neurosis. It's pretty much tied. I'm not going to tell you the answer because we're going to have a post-test quiz. So question number two. Periocular burns can cicatrize and contract over what time period? So several hours, several days, several weeks, or several months? Okay, so we see it seems to be split between several days, several weeks, and several months. Okay. Which is not a complication of intralesional injection of a scar with the following medications. So triamcinolone, which is a steroid, hypopigmentation, or soft tissue atrophy, and 5-fluorouracil, skin necrosis, and hyperpigmentation. 5-fluorouracil and hyperpigmentation. Okay, all right, very good. Okay, so just to highlight the objectives for today, we're gonna talk about general principles of managing periocular trauma discuss potential sequelae of eyelid trauma. I will discuss non-surgical management options uh, for periocular scarring, and then also discuss surgical techniques um, for um, repairing periocular scarring as well. So first of all, you know, we're ophthalmologists, and when we see patients in the acute setting, sometimes they've already been managed by the emergency room doctors, but sometimes they come to our clinics, um, whether they should or should not. <laughs> And it's always important, I say, to evaluate the overall patient. And remember that we are physicians before we are ophthalmologists. So, um, you know, some of these patients with severe trauma, you want to look out for, you know, what is their neurological status? If they've had, you know, brain trauma and they're neurologically not intact, they need to, that becomes a priority more so than fixing their eyelid. Um, also, you know, if they have a C-spine injury, you know, think about their neck. Um, here, this is a image of a, a C-spine fracture um, causing uh, compression of the, the spinal cord. Um, and then certainly just remember like basic things like what are their vital signs? I mean, eyelid lacerations can be repaired several days, you know, if needed, uh, weeks later. Um, so uh, certainly consider the overall patient and the priorities. Um, then, you know, after physicians, we are ophthalmologists. So we certainly want to check the eye and the orbit because um, if they have a ruptured globe, you really don't want to be manipulating the eye and 
expulsing the contents of their eye. So, you know, first do your eye exam, a thorough eye exam, check everything. Uh, and then if it seems appropriate, again, then you can proceed in fixing the eyelid laceration, which again is not urgent. Um, for patients who have like contaminated uh, wounds, you could consider giving them a tetanus shot. Um, certainly in cases where there's been like road accidents and there's a lot of gravel and dirt, um, you want to clean the wound and irrigate it extensively. Um, the same applies for any type of chemical injury, of course. Um, you want to get as much of the foreign bodies out as possible. And it, sometimes it's a very tedious and laborious process. And sometimes you irrigate it and it doesn't come out, but you have to put in like a wet four by wet gauze and, and then the particles are coming out on the gauze. So um, really take the time to do a good cleaning. Um, and, then, and then finally, you can evaluate for like lid lacerations um, and if there's any tissue loss. Um, the majority of times there really is no tissue loss, even though it looks like there's tissue loss. So if the eyelid is cut, it tends to splay apart um, and it looks like there's a chunk missing and you say, gee, I think that dog actually ate part of the eyelid, but it's very rare that the dog actually ate, eats the eyelid. It no more commonly tears or avulses um, and uh, even blunt trauma can cause a uh, avulsion of the eyelid. So um, I like to always categorize, you know, our different types of lacerations as oculofacial uh, surgeons. So um, very oftentimes for non-marginal lid lacs, uh, people will actually not even call ophthalmology sometimes. They'll just call the emergency room doctor or the plastic surgeons um, who honestly don't study the eyelid as much as we do. <laughs> and they're not as familiar with the anatomy. So here you see the, a beautiful diagram of you know, the sagittal view of the eyelid and the orbit. Um, and when we talk, I'd say the danger is that when you see a non-marginal eyelid laceration, there can still be significant injury that needs to be repaired um, by someone who knows the anatomy. Um, so if you look at the arrow over here, if you have a non-marginal laceration that, um, that penetrates or above the level of the tarsus in the upper lid, you can actually go through the orbital septum, go through the fat, and actually transect the levator upon neurosis. Um, and uh, we have a patient uh, later this afternoon um, who actually had just that. So he has complete ptosis. Um, he had a lid laceration repaired, and he has almost no levator function at this point. Um, so uh, probably what happened was that he had the levator cut. Nobody explored it properly and repaired it. And as a result, uh, his lid is completely totic. So even though it's not non-marginal, it can still be very dangerous. And, um, and the same breath as we said, explore the orbit. You know, eyelid laceration, you need to make sure that the globe hasn't been penetrated as well. Um, so one thing I always tell my residents, if you ever see fat prolapsing out of a laceration, that means that the orbital septum has been violated. And if that's been violated, there could be deep injury to the levator. So um, always when you see fat, your knee jerk response should be to explore the levator and if necessary, repair it. Um, and you can, you can actually you know, take a look, you can have the patient look up and down. And if they have no movement, um, you can tell that you can suspect that something's going on. Now the marginal lid lacerations, uh, most of you seem like you've already done these before. And um, like I said, uh, Dr. Antonio Lucio Alvarez is going to be spending a little bit more time uh, later on today and tomorrow talking about uh, the, the details of lid laceration repair. But um, just briefly, the diagram here you see um, it's very important to align the lid margin. And the three landmarks that I generally think of are the, the tarsus, um, which it, so I like to sew through the meibomian gland orifices. Then the most anterior part is the lash line. So you align the lashes so they're in a nice little row. And then right in between that is the gray line, and you can put another aligning suture. Um, and then what's very critical is to place your lamellar tarsal closure bites. So in an upper eyelid, I typically like to place three. In a lower lid, I like to place two. And that's really the strength layer, layer um, that's going to hold everything together because um, if you close the lid margin with silk sutures, you're going to take those out typically after one to two weeks. And um, if you don't place good lamellar tarsal passes, uh, everything can open up again. 
Um, canalicular lacerations are important uh, because, you know, we like to preserve that anatomy whenever possible. Um, you know, generally we say it's ideal to, to repair this within, you know, a few days after the injury because after that it becomes increasingly more difficult. And a couple uh, pointers um, uh, I'd like to give, you know, um, having struggled this when I was first starting out as a resident, it's very important to have excellent illumination. If you don't have a headlight or good illumination, it's extremely difficult to find the cut ends. Um, and so, again, you know, we'll cover that in a separate lecture a little bit more. And typically, we put a stent in place to preserve it. But I also say, you know what? It's not the end of the world if just one of the canaliculi is cut. Um, so remember that for our dry eye patients, we actually put in plugs or even seal off the lower lid punctum and the canaliculus, you know, by proxy because no tears can go down. And most patients do great. You know, as long as you have one canaliculus and punctum open, you know, the vast majority of patients are totally fine and don't have epiphora. So again, it's, we make a big deal about canalicular lacerations, but it's not like a life or death thing, you know, especially if they have um, another canaliculus intact. But of course, we repair it whenever possible. And then finally, um, this is more rare, but you know, sometimes we see patients with more extensive facial lacerations who are really gashed. Um, and in those patients, I'd encourage you to um, check their facial nerve function uh, because if the facial nerve is cut, it's not game over. You know, the ideal treatment of that is to directly repair the facial nerve. And you can have excellent you know, uh, improvement in facial nerve function. So we don't typically do that very often, but call your, fa your facial plastics colleagues. They know how to repair facial nerves and you sew the perineurium together and anastomose the nerve and you can preserve that function. That's very important to do, the sooner the better, whenever possible. So um, now let's talk a little bit about periocular burns and scars, you know, scars from lacerations or burns. Um, and this is, again, this is one of my, uh, top topics of interest, um, and I've actually done some research um, that I'll talk about a little bit later about how we can rehabilitate scars and the scarring complications around the eyelid. Um, so um, very importantly, I say, you know, sometimes we see patients in the trauma bay or acutely after the laceration, and we fix them, and we never see them again. So we never really see what happens to them, you know, weeks or months down the road. But uh, the wound healing process and scar remodeling, I tell patients that occurs over a year. So if patients complain after a blepharoplasty, oh, my incisions are a little bit thickened and they don't worry, your scar is gonna improve over the course of a year. Like if you've ever cut your leg, you might know that you know, the scar is initially a bit thickened, it's a little bit red and then it flattens and it gets better and better over time. But the same is true with any, um, any wound healing and any incision and any scar. Um, but in terms of the cicatricial forces, um, this really develops and progresses over the first few months. So I always tell patients, you know, you are not out of the woods, you know, once your laceration is repaired or for if you had a burn, once the skin epithelializes, you're still not out of the woods because typically over the first three to four months, everything starts to tighten and contract. And if they didn't, ha if they look perfect on the table or after your surgery, they may look completely disfigured if you see them back in three to four months. So there's, there's things that you can do. You have to follow these patients closely and we'll talk about ways to mitigate that. So you really have to follow them and manage you know, the post-surgical course in order to have a good result. Uh, but certainly scarring around the eyelid, it can cause ectropion, especially with burns because you have a wide surface area of contracture. Um, Entropion, if there's uh, involvement of the, you know, a full thickness laceration of the lid and, you know, maybe when it was closed by the emergency, resident, emergency medicine resident, they took big bites through the conjunctiva and caused everything to cicatrize inwards. Um, you can certainly have lagophthalmos and it's a cicatricial lagophthalmos. Very oftentimes it accompanies cicatricial ectropion. Um, you can sometimes have eyelid retraction along with the ectropion. Um, and then, you know, um, and then there can be a lot of disfigurement from this. I'll show you some photos and, um, you know, patients of mine said, I look like a Halloween special. So in the U.S., Halloween is when you 
dress up in a scary mask and it can be really disfiguring and um, uh, and so it's very important even if their cornea is fine and they're seeing fine even if their lid position is normal just a scar in this really prime aesthetic region around our eyes can be devastating especially for uh, younger individuals so um, we'll also talk very briefly about types of scarring. Um, scars come in very many, many different varieties. So um, especially in the Caribbean, um, in darker skin patients, um, hypertrophic scars um, are very common um, and keloids. Uh, so the, di the difference between hypertrophic scars uh, is that a hypertrophic scar is just when it gets thickened, but it doesn't expand beyond the bounds, boundaries of the incision or wound. Um, keloids can grow like a mushroom. So like I've seen patients who had a little ear piercing and they have a huge cauliflower type scar keloid um, on their earlobe. So uh, that's when it goes outside the bounds. So most of the time we're talking about hypertrophic scars because it's very rare to have keloids on the face and on the eyelids. Um, but that's probably the most common type of, of scarring. Uh, but there can also be atrophic or depressed scars for example, if incisions are not closed properly and the skin edges are not averted and brought together, you can have a depressed scar where it's actually sunken inward um, or there's been tissue atrophy and it's like flat, depressed uh, compared to the surrounding area. Um, and then there's a lot of um, characteristics of scars. So, so when, when there's certain um, you know, ways that we evaluate scars in different standardized scales and some of the things we look at are the, thick, the thickness and elevation of the scar, the pliability of the scar, uh, the pigmentation of the scar, uh, which goes along with redness, and also how widened or you know, how, what's the width of the base of the scar. So those are all things that you can kind of think about and you know, consider documenting uh, when you're uh, examining patients. So this is a patient who I just saw you know, a couple weeks before uh, I came here and she had a fall. You know, she just fell on the ground, cut her eyelid and face, and it's not a marginal lid laceration. Uh, so, you know, she went to the emergency room, uh, had it repaired by an emergency room resident or doctor. Um, and this is what she looked like just uh, about two to three weeks after surgery. Um, and so you can see she has this, uh, you know, uh, oblique scar. And you can almost imagine the force is pulling directly along that scar. So um, she has uh, cicatricial ectropion. She has cicatricial eyelid retraction. You can see there's more scleral show down below. Um, and she also has lag ophthalmos and a lot of you know, foreign body sensation, exposure keratopathy symptoms. Um, so what I did was I said, first of all, you need to massage it like crazy. You want to massage it against the, the vector of pull. Um, so do that as much as you can. I gave her intralesional 5-FU injection into the scar. Um, I did fractional ablative laser resurfacing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then, you know, after making these little laser holes in the scar, I topically applied 5-FU, which goes down the holes and penetrates into the scar. Um, so there's a lot of different, as you can see just from this patient, there's a lot of different ways and modalities of treatment that we can combine to give patients the best result. Um, these are other uh, you know, patients that I've seen or taken care of. Um, this is a patient who had extensive burn scars around the eyelid and you can see you know, she had some skin grafting done to try to repair the cyclotrochotropion. She still has lag ophthalmos, you know, this eye still doesn't close. And this is why I say that you know, skin grafting and surgery is not always the solution for addressing uh, cicatricial ectropion because when you cut, especially you cut into scar tissue, it's going to scar again. So you know, that's why we'll talk about how you can manage uh, these things non-surgically and that's often a better option than surgery. This is a patient of mine um, from Afghanistan uh, who had, no, oh no, I'm sorry, from Iraq who had an improvised explosive device blow up in his face and he had, again, extensive facial burns. He had a lot of skin grafting. You can see he lost his eyebrows and had eyebrow transplants. And even with all of the surgery and skin grafting, he still has lag ophthalmos, the cosmetic. I mean, even if the eyes close, the, the aesthetic 
you know, result is terrible. Like he, you know, it's devastating. He doesn't look like the same person anymore. So how can we try to minimize scarring when we're doing our laceration repairs or if even after the, the laceration has been repaired, how can we try to improve the wound healing process, which we talked about as being much longer than, you know, just when the surgery finishes. So first of all, you know, I think it's very important to choose the appropriate sutures for skin closure. So sometimes I've seen patients with eyelid lacerations that have been repaired with 3.0 and 4.0 proline sutures. Those are way too big. You know, so eyelid skin, I typically close with 6.0 sutures. Um, and if it's like on the cheek or on thicker skin away from the eyelid, I typically use 5.0. Um, you know, if you're thinking about what is going to be the best option for the patient in terms of, you know, the most beautiful scar afterwards, um, non-absorbable sutures are best. So nylon and proline are great options. Um, if you think about um, the dissolvable sutures, they don't magically dissolve. The body breaks them down from your immune system through inflammation. And so your body is breaking this down. There's more inflammation. Um, and even in my blepharoplasty patients, I know that if I use a 6-0 fast-absorbing gut suture, the incision's going to be a little bit redder, a little bit thicker, especially initially. I think eventually they almost even out, but certainly early on it's going to be better. Um, uh, so second point, appropriate time removal. So I've seen patients where it's been left in for like three to four weeks, um, and that's way too long. They can end up with track marks um, and, you know, other issues. So I typically... Um, take things out after seven to 10 days, unless there's a concern for infection or some other special circumstances. Um, the idea to minimize a scar is that you want to have good deep layer closure so there's zero tension on the skin. So that's the same thing that we talk about when we're doing something like a facelift. You know, if you have you know, a lot of tension on the skin, it's gonna widen the scars, there's gonna be visible scars, um, it's not gonna look nice. Um, and the same here, if you, you have to use deep closures to have almost zero tension on the skin, and that way um, you're not going to have this widened and hypertrophic scar. So um, one of my friends who's a swimmer had a shoulder surgery, and this incision was right over the shoulder joint. And if you can imagine, we're constantly moving our shoulder and putting tensile forces and stretch on that scar. She had the most widened and hypertrophic scar you know, I'd almost ever seen in the I felt bad because she's a very attractive uh, swimmer. But, um, but yeah, that just goes to show that um, you really want to try to minimize tension. Um, there's other thoughts. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, if there's uh, an incision on the forehead, you know, some people talk about actually doing Botox to the forehead to minimize the frontalis function. Because if you imagine you're lifting your brows at the time, you're, you're actually stretching on that incision. So if you kind of paralyze the forehead with Botox, or at least minimize the movement, you are reducing um, that. Um, sec finally, then, not finally, but I also want to talk about how the skin likes to heal. So the skin likes to heal in a moist environment. And whether that be with antibiotic ointment, with silicone gel, or even just plain old like Vaseline, which is white petrolatum, um, skin heals better and faster in a moist environment. So um, in the US, um, pretty much most of the Mohs surgeon or most dermatologists, when they take off uh, skin excision, do skin excision and closures of lesions, they don't, they've moved away from using antibiotic ointments. They just recommend Vaseline because they've shown patients have a better result and fewer complications and side effects and contact dermatitis. I typically still, you know, have patients use an antibiotic ointment, you know, for the first one to two weeks. But if they're having irritation and they're allergic to like 10 or 12 different medications, I say, you know what, just use Vaseline and you're going to probably be fine. Um, silicone strips and creams, uh, these are uh, things that have been around for a while. Um, silicone has been shown to help flatten hypertrophic scars. There's a lot of new silicone gel, you know, things that are on the market now. And these are, tend to help reduce the redness. And it's not totally understood why and how this works, but um, the, idea, the thought is that the, it reduces the, um, the, the stretch and the inflammation and keeps it hydrated and various things that just improve the wound healing. And then finally, um, to improve the final appearance of the scar, you want to minimize ultraviolet light exposure. So 
you know, if it's around the eyelids, you know, use sunglasses, sunscreen, hats, avoid sun, um, and that's going to help the scar um, to improve faster. Okay, so now let's talk about what things that we as, you know, as proceduralists and um, as physicians, what can we do in the clinic to help patients, um, you know, modulate their wound healing process and improve the appearance of the scar. Um, so certainly we talked about eyelid massage. That's very easy. It's stretching the shortage of skin, so especially for the patient with cicatricial ectropion, cicatricial lag of thomas. You know, I have them do frequent eyelid massage to just loosen up the skin and exert traction opposite the vector of pull of the scar. Um, intralesional injections of medications are very important. Um, 5-FU is something that we use in glaucoma surgery because we know it inhibits scarring. It's an anti-metabolite uh, that inhibits, you know, these fibroblasts that, you know, become hyperactive in the, in the wound healing phase. So it can really release the traction, release the contractures, flatten hypertrophic scars. It's a wonderful medication. Triamcinolone is another option. I'd say um, for my darker skin patients, I generally try to avoid triamcinolone and definitely avoid it in high doses because it certainly can cause hypopigmentation, um, if, especially like the stuff we inject into the eye, like 40 milligrams per ml of uh, triamcinolone, that can certainly hypopigment things. You know, you want to do like five to 10 milligrams per ml, you know, you'd probably be okay, but I generally tend to be more conservative um, you know, especially in dark skin patients. If it's a lighter skin patient, um, like a Caucasian patient, you know, um, you're probably okay. But uh, in dermatology, they have done split scar, uh, split scar studies. So they've actually injected half the scar with 5-FU and half the, the side with uh, uh, triamcinolone. And what uh, they've generally found is that uh, triamcinolone can cause more widening of the base of the scar. Uh, well, they're both effective in flattening the scar, but the, the steroids can widen the base of the scar, can cause um, tissue atrophy, uh, can cause hypopigmentation, and also it's more associated with like telangiectasia formation on the scar as well. So um, generally, the literature nowadays, you know, comparing 5-FU to Kenalog, there's been randomized controlled trials. Uh, 5-FU generally tends to be preferred. Fractional ablative laser resurfacing is... Um, uh, something that I've done um, some work uh, in, and uh, we've, I've published a paper uh, in our ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery journal about the use of this laser resurfacing um, for cicatricial ectropion and lagophthalmos and periocular scarring. And I'll show you some some photos, um, you know, from that paper. Um, and then this concept of laser-assisted drug delivery that goes hand in hand with the laser resurfacing. And the concept is that the laser drills all these little channels into the scar, and then you drip this medication, um, just topically applied, and it can penetrate deep into the scar, much deeper than you know, it ever would if, you, if the skin were intact. Um, so let's jump to a case. This is a, the first patient that I did this technique of uh, laser resurfacing for scars on. Um, so this is a 27-year-old patient. Uh, he came to me about six weeks after a severe motorcycle accident where he had second and third degree burns to his face. So you can see, you know, his forehead is burned, the eyelids are burned, his cheek is burned. Um, and, you know, and then about three weeks before he saw me, so three weeks after the, the burns, he started developing progressive lag of thalamus, foreign body sensation, tearing, and his vision was slightly down. He had a exposure keratopathy. So here you can see um, he has cicatricial brow elevation because of the contracture of the forehead is pulling his brow up which in turn is causing secondary eyelid retraction as well you can see that the upper lid is uh, ectropic you can see under tarsal the tarsus underneath um, you can see it's very disfiguring in terms of the pigmentation and the texture of the skin and again in the, the third uh, photo there you can see it's very ectropic the lash line is distorted, um, doesn't look good, and, it's, and he said it's still getting worse. So are we going to cut on him and put a skin graft in right now? I'm not that excited to do that. <laughs> I mean, it's cutting through scar. It's still getting worse. You're going to cause more trauma. So the, the traditional thing was, well, 
wait three or four months, wait till he's all terrible and stable, <laughs> and then try to go and cut through the scar. But I think, as you'll see, I think our paradigm is changing, and that's not what I recommend anymore. Um, generally, I recommend that you have to start doing these interventions early in when things are, are, typically I like to do my interventions about three or four weeks you know, after the injury. But the earlier, the better. Some people are talking about even doing it like immediate post-op or you know, one week after at the time of suture removal. But earlier is better than later. Um, so this is what I did. So this patient didn't have any health insurance. We couldn't even take him to the OR if we wanted to, or we'd incur him you know, thousands of dollars of bills. So what I did first was I injected um, some 5-fluorouracil mixed with trimcinolone. Um, and you can see a few things. So you know, his brow came down. Um, his eyelid is no longer ectropic. Um, there's still a little bit of distortion of the lash line, but his eye actually can close now. So that's pretty amazing if you inject these cheap medications. Um, I did three injections spaced about one month apart. Um, and, uh, you know, and he had significant improvement. But I'd say, you know, he's not, it's not, he was very happy, but he still was not, you know, thrilled with his appearance. You can see that there's still extensive um, hyperpigmentation and redness. Um, he did have a little bit of hypopigmentation from the triamcinolone. Uh, and the texture, I mean, he just doesn't look like himself anymore. Um, this is uh, just an, a different shot, you know, following those three injections. And you can see there's really hyper, there's still hypertrophic scars there, even though his lid position is better. Um, and then this is him after doing four sessions of fractional ablative laser. Um, as with laser-assisted delivery of the 5 fluorier so dripping it down the holes, I just apply it immediately after the laser and then put a little bit of, um, you know, like Vaseline on it afterwards. And you can see there's significant improvement in the texture, you know, the pliability of the scars, you know, the, the pigmentation is improved. Um, there's further improvement of the lash line. Um, so I think, you know, he was, at this point, he was okay, like going out in public again. And he felt really transformed. But it's not, he's not perfect, but it's still a dramatic thing. And I'd say that you cannot achieve this type of result by slapping a skin graft on there. Um, it doesn't do anything for the hyperpigmentation and it's prone to um, graft contracture and shrinkage and recicatrization. Um, this is just another view from the side. You can see the improvement in the texture of the skin. Um, and then this is again, just showing what you can achieve with just intralesional injection but then what you're able to do in terms of the texture, the pigmentation, um, and the tone of the skin um, with laser. And so, uh, but I will say that intralesional injections are not a perfect solution and it's not, that, it's not that they cannot have complications as well. So as we saw over here, you know, this is when, my, uh, when I was just first starting out and I injected a little bit too much of a concentration of Kenalog. Um, and so, you know, nowadays I would probably do a lot lower concentration if, or maybe even skip the Kenalog. Um, this is actually um, one of my friends who was just starting out treating uh, scars and she injected her dad's knee incision. Um, and she, I think she injected a little too much because she, there was skin necrosis and you can actually see the deep tissue underneath. And I was like, shoot. I hope he doesn't get a knee infection from this. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think, you know, the knee and other parts of the, the body are less vascular than the faces. Um, so I think it's less, you have to be very careful injecting, you know, over joints and things. Um, but still, you know, it's not impossible to have skin necrosis um, if you inject too much 5-FU um, um, as well. So you have to just be mindful that you don't want to overdo it. Yeah, did you have a question? What concentration of 5-FU? That's a great question. So, you know, in the published literature, um, the, the typical 5-FU concentration when it comes out of the bottle is 50 milligrams per ml. Um, and people have published injecting it straight up. Um, and people have injected, you know, forming their own cocktail, diluting again, it like half and ha half with normal saline with 5-FU. You know, so people have used lower concentrations, but they all seem to work. Um, and then sometimes people will 
mix it in with just a very low dose, maybe like five or 10 milligrams per ml Kenalog with it. I, I use different concentrations. So I like to mix in a little bit of lidocaine with it because as you're doing the injections, they're a little bit more comfortable because it does burn as you're injecting it. So I mix in a little bit of lidocaine and then sometimes I add in like about five to 10 milligrams per ml of Kenalog. But it was like a really hypertrophic, really aggressive looking scar. I'll typically inject it straight up. Um, if it's just like more of a mild scar and you know, it's not too bad, I'll sometimes use a lower concentration. So it's very individualized. Yes, question. Great question. How much volume do I inject? So that's a very loaded question. I'd, so I'd say if it's the entire forehead, periocular region and cheek, you can inject a lot more than if it's just a small, short, linear incision. So it's really dosed to the treatment area. Yeah, so if it's like, say, a, a small incision around the eyelid, you know, I might inject maybe like about 0.3 to 0.5. You know, if it's ex like in that patient who had you know, the, the whole forehead and the cheek, I probably did about two or two and a half cc's of medication total total across the whole area yeah 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 i mean I, you can there's different ways of injecting you know so some people will inject like little micro boluses um, some people will inject in a retrograde fashion so if you have a linear scar that's hypertrophic you can sometimes just inject and then inject as you're coming out um, a lot of these scars that are really thick it's hard if you just inject it and you try to push fluid, it's so t the tissue is so tight, it's hard to inject. So you, it's, that's why it's very nice to inject and then, in, uh, and then inject retrograde because you created a needle track and then you're injecting as you're coming out. That's the same way we do it when we're injecting fillers for aesthetic purposes a lot of times. It's a safe way to do it. And the idea is that you want to get, deliver your medication throughout the entire volume of the scar. So if you have a scar that's three or four millimeters thick, you want to be injecting some of the medication at the base of the scar as well as midway through the scar. So it, think about that. You know, you're trying to you know, deliver medication throughout the entire volume of that scar. Okay. Um, this is another clinical example of a patient of mine um, who had uh, a burn scar to the lower eyelid. And then you could see as it contracted, he had some lower eyelid retraction. Um, this is completely non-surgical again. Um, he had two sessions of laser resurfacing um, with uh, topical delivery of 5 fluorouracil um, I can't get into the full explanation of how, you know, the ablative lasers work. But you might say, well, if you're doing an ablative laser and drilling holes, why aren't you causing more scarring? Um, or why are you not causing the tissue to contract? Because when we do laser resurfacing for aesthetics, it tightens the skin. Um, so... What you do here is that you have to use a very low density um, of treatment. So when I do the laser treatment for scars, I do only treat about five to 10% of the total surface area. Um, and what uh, dermatologists have found after doing skin punch biopsies after laser is that if you make these tiny holes, it actually can heal without a scar. And histologically, the scar tissue is replaced with more normal appearing tissue. So that's the paradox of you know, creating an injury, but this injury can heal without a scar when it's a micro injury. Um, this is another patient who had uh, a trichophytic um, brow and forehead lift, and she had a little bit of a redness and visibility of the scar, and this is after um, treating it with um, you know, one session of laser with laser-assisted delivery of Kenalog. You don't have to worry about hypopigmentation as much with Kenalog if it's just laser-assisted delivery. There's a very small amount that drips down the hole. Um, and, then, uh, and then finally, you know, the surgical treatment for scars. We won't get into the details of this, but classically, you release the scar tissue, uh, create a recipient site for the skin graft, and then you harvest tissue from somewhere else in the body. So the best option for eyelid skin is eyelid skin. <laughs> so if they have extra skin on the other side, you, wanna, you can do a blepharoplasty, take that skin, and use it to reconstruct the eyelid. Sometimes the patients don't have a lot of extra skin, or maybe both sides have been burned. My next option is typically retroauricular skin because it's hidden behind the ear. 
is typically not sun damaged in patients who have had a lot of sun exposure. Um, and you know, you really can't see the incision. And if patients do have are self-conscious about their ears being too visible, I say, well, you get a free ear pin back from this procedure. <laughs> it's going to pin your ears back, which some patients pay good money to have <laughs> done. Um, so, and then if that's not enough, um, other options include supraclavicular skin or even on the inner arm. Um, you want to find skin that's thin and hairless um, for the eyelid whenever possible. Yes, question. Great question. So the question is, if you're taking eyelid skin from the other side, are you going to cause a problem for the other side? Um, and the question is, it depends on the patient. So if it's a 15-year-old patient, they don't have a lot of dermatochelasis in there because they're young. Uh, but if you have a 70 or 80-year-old patient they probably, who've never had a blepharoplasty, they're definitely going to have some extra skin up there. Um, so you have to evaluate the individual patient. Um, so other options include uh, Z-plasties to kind of relax the, the, the tension along a certain vector. Um, you can do rotational flaps just like we do for eyelid reconstruction sometimes, advancement flaps. Um, and then sometimes if they have, I'd say, uh, lax facial tissue is your friend in reconstruction. So, you know, if they have um, significant facial laxity, you can do like a mid face lift and recruit tissue from lower down on the face to help, you know, with lid retraction or ectropion and whatnot. Um, so in conclusion, you know, eyelid trauma can have ocular and periocular sequelae, both with respect to the vision, the closure of the eye, but also um, disfigurement and, you know, for the patient's overall sense of self. Uh, periocular scarring can be managed with various non-surgical options that we talked about, including um, intralesional medication injections, massage, silicone cream, lasers. Um, fractional blade of lasers are kind of becoming uh, I, what I believe is the new gold standard for scar rehabilitation. They can correct cicatrial ectropion and retraction and ligophthalmos, um, as well as improve the textural, uh, pigmentary, um, and overall appearance of the scar in ways that surgery cannot. And finally, um, surgical management certainly can be considered as part of a multi-pronged rehabilitative approach. So we use all of the techniques at our disposal, figure out what would be the best combination for our individual patient, and that's how we're going to get them to have the best outcome. So let's see if anybody learned anything. <laughs> um, back to our first question. What must be done in an upper eyelid laceration when orbital fat is prolapsing? So explore the levator aponeurosis. You do not need to close the orbital septum and, you know, unless there's other reasons to suspect issues with trauma to the extraocular muscles, you don't need to explore the other stuff. Um, periocular burns can cicatrize and contract over what time period? Um, excellent. So months. So it does contract over weeks, but it, does, it keeps contracting over months as well. So um, uh, which is not a complication of intralesional injection? Fifillary cell does not generally cause any pigmentary changes in the skin. So it's good for all skin types. All right. And thank you very much. That's my email if you have any questions. Um, 